But meanwhile, just wanted to welcome everyone and introduce ourselves. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators of the Core Investments Project, which I'll describe in just a moment. And I'm joined with Nicole Young, the other Nicole and other facilitator. So we both welcome you and our guests to today's session. But before we get into that discussion, we know that some of you are familiar with the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE, but we also wanted to give a quick overview and we'll come back to more details about our guests and our topic today. So first of all, some of you know that for the last couple of years, we've been working with many community partners, many of you on the call, on the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being in our county for everyone of all ages across the lifespan across the county. And working with all of you, we have developed mission and vision statements, both of which have equity at the center. And again, these have been developed with input from all of you, many partners throughout the community, and a fair amount of wordsmithing and input, but they have in common this very important concept of equity and equitable health and well being, by which we mean equitable opportunities to achieve health and well being. Some of you may also have seen this core conditions graphic, which tries to connect the different aspects of all of this work. And so let's just talk a little bit about what that means. So for us, equitable health and well-being means that you can't predict an outcome based on somebody's race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, any other defining characteristic. So we have real equal opportunities to achieve these things. But for us more specifically and relevant to today's coffee chat, we have a real emphasis on how all of these core conditions are connected with equity at the center. So whether you work in any one of these spheres or arenas, the connection to others is really what CORE is all about. So for example, COVID-19 required closing childcare, schools, et cetera, to, and workplaces to protect students, families, staff, and the community overall. And that had a lot of effects on the emotional well-being of children, families, and staff, and, and concerns about things like increased domestic violence, um, unreported child abuse and neglect. And then there was an, a, a lot of ripple effects from economic insecurity as well. And that in turn affects access to stable, affordable housing and shelter, levels of safety and justice that people may be experiencing at home or in their workplaces and the community overall. And along with all of those struggles, we've also been hearing a lot of stories and trying to lift them up in these coffee chats about how COVID has amplified or catalyzed a lot of creative collective responses that have increased things like community connectedness and, and had some positive ripple effects on other core conditions. So the staff and administrators in the birth through 12 education system are preparing for reopening, which is our subject today. But as they do that, they're listening to families and public health officials and each other to ensure that these plans address health, safety, social, emotional, and academic needs of everyone, all the students and families, the staff and administrators. And in turn, reopening the childcare settings and schools will support our economic recovery um, throughout Santa Cruz County. If we continue to work collectively and channel our momentum from these peaceful protests against racist policies and systems, the movement to rebuild a safe and just community will be inseparable from the movement for educational, economic, and environmental justice. So these core coffee chats are one way to try to connect the, the lines, the dots, as you see here, but also build and inspire collective action from all of us working together. We're calling this capacity building effort the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact as an umbrella for all of these capacity building training, technical assistance, conversations and events like the Core Coffee Chats. 
And we really hope to expand these in the future, but so far we've been, as you, many of you know, because you've been attending, which we appreciate, um, we've been trying to mix the more practical sorts of how to use Zoom or how to use data share, which we did last week, with some things that share current or emerging information like today and some more reflective ones. And at the end of today's chat, stay tuned for some details about what we've got planned for the next month or so. But we always welcome your ideas for topics to add. So thank you for keeping those coming. And I'll turn this back over to Nicole Young to introduce today's guests, and then we'll get right into our discussion. So thanks for being here. Great, Nicole. thank you, Nicole. And I get the uh, pleasure of introducing our guests, all three of whom I've, I've worked closely with for many years now, and, and we're just really grateful that each of them has taken the time to be with us here today. They all um, have many connections and information that I think we'll all get to benefit from today. And so I want to start just by uh, telling you a little bit about each one of them, and then we'll uh, start our, our dialogue with them. So. Super happy to have Dr. Ferris Sabah join us this morning. He's the, if you don't know already, he's the County Superintendent of Schools uh, for the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. And Ferris is, in my experience, a uh, very visionary and community-centered leader. And equity is at the center of his being and everything that he does. And you'll see that in the County Office of Education's new strategic plan. Um, but it's also more than just words for Ferris. Uh, you know, you'll see it in his actions and the way that he shows up in the community, the way that he listens to people, the way that he creates opportunities and really uh, models that collaborative spirit to find solutions to challenges that, that often seem insurmountable. So very pleased to have Ferris with us here today. Uh, we're also joined by Diane Munoz, who is the coordinator for the Childhood Advisory Council, which is also part of the County Office of Education. Um, the Childhood Advisory Council is also known as the Local Child Care Planning Council. And I've served on that for many years, actually, uh, when my kids were still under five years old, and they're now um, young adults and teenagers. So long time. And Diane has helped guide the process of um, really taking that child care planning council and, and helping it develop into a more active advocacy voice and, and body advocacy body for early care and education. And I know that during this COVID crisis, Diane has really been connected to early care and education providers and programs and so has a real good sense of how this has been impacting them and children and families. So also very pleased to have Diane with us here today. And then David Brody, who's the executive director of First Five Santa Cruz County, who I've also had the pleasure of working with for many years and also consider him a visionary leader and a very strong advocate for investing in early childhood and ensuring that the programs and the policies and the service delivery system that affect families' everyday lives is actually enabling them to give their children the best start in life because you know, everything in science tells us that what happens in the first five years of life affects a whole lifetime of health and economic and social and educational outcomes. And so we are um, going to hear from each one of them and pose some questions to them and, so, and they'll take turns answering them. And just know that as we, uh, sorry, the names are not showing up on the slide. And as we uh, go through this discussion with the three of them, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, pose those questions to Diane and Ferris and David after we hear from each of them. And any questions we don't get to today, we're gonna ask for their help with providing answers afterwards. And we'll send that as part of our follow-up email with the link to this recording. Okay, so let's dive right into it. We're going to start with this first question, just to help, help us all get a sense of the magnitude and, and also the nuances of the impact of COVID-19 and sheltering in place on our community. And so, Diane, we'll actually start with you and ask you to share your thoughts about, you know, what's been the biggest impact of closing childcare, you know, except for essential workers, um, what have, what have you been seeing or hearing from childcare programs and providers? 
And Diane, you're on mute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here this morning. Um, and I just want to say, you know, your, your introduction is so uh, spot on, uh, just in terms of um, uh, mentioning the social emotional effects of, of the COVID pandemic on, on our community to begin with, but, um, but also looking at it through the lens of early care and education and how uh, it's created a disconnect between uh, the children and families and child care providers um, in an industry where uh, connection is so vital and it's an integral piece of how, how that industry works and functions. And so um, it, you know, the not being able to, to be able to have the ability to touch or to see each other, or to, to have uh, daily interactions has been um, very, I'd say traumatic because um, we're seeing it in our kids, you know, even those programs who are open, uh, it's very difficult to tell a child, I can't touch you. Or when a child wants a hug, I can't hug you. Um, we're coming up with different ways of giving a butterfly um, hug instead. And so, um, but I think that, you know, this, uh, this pandemic has really, you know, had a, a deep effect on the childcare industry as a whole. Uh, and not only them, but also everyone else in our community too, as well. You know, not being able to connect with each other, to see each other on a daily basis has been quite a, an experience for all of us. Um, we value the Zoom meetings because we're at least we're able to see each other, right? So, um, so I'd say that philosophically, you know, just in terms of how uh, childcare as itself uh, functions, it has had a dramatic effect on the children and the families and the childcare providers involved in the in the industry as a whole. Um, the other effect I would say um, that has occurred is. You know, our childcare industry to begin with has not been very sustainable. I mean, it's it's a fragile industry that's based on patchwork funding uh, from various sources, whether it's families or local funders or state funding, and it's never been funded at the at the level that it should have been or should be. And so, I think that you know, my other concern is now that we have uh, programs that have been closed. Uh, and staff that have been furloughed and so forth, reopening, I think, is going to be a challenge. Uh, uh, we don't know, uh, again, how many of our programs are going to reopen, are going to be sustainable. We don't know, uh, in particular, if all staff are going to return to the industry and to their jobs. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the childcare industry as a whole, as I see it. In addition, I think, you know, the the industry as itself, um, as all in other industries are opening, uh, is really the cornerstone of the working class and everyone who works in our, in our community. And without childcare, uh, other families are not going to be able to go back to work. It's going to be a difficult situation. And so, um, the lack of slots and availability of childcare is going to be coming into question. Uh, and being able to serve all the the, the uh, working uh, community as they return back to work is going to may be a challenge for us. So um, those are things that I've been hearing and uh, and I've been on a lot of calls with a lot of different sectors of, of the child care community and and those are a couple of concerns that I think that uh, we'll be uh, keeping track of and trying to support as we continue through the um, the reopening of our of our community. Great, thanks, Diane. And David, what about you? What do you, what are, I know you've been in contact with several of the early care and education programs providers that have stayed open to provide child care for essential workers. Is there anything you want to add in terms of some of the major issues you've been hearing about or seeing from their perspective? Sure, yeah. Um, recognizing that the majority of those that have remained open have been family child care homes, um, but there have been some centers and that's changing every day. But the central theme is the one of the last words that Diane, Diane hit on, which is um, 
uncertainty, right? Uncertainty about can I remain open, especially as the crisis hit? Who is an essential worker? How is that defined? What is an at-risk population as it became defined by the state? What does this stable group concept mean? Um, does my stable group size have to be a maximum of 10 or 12? There was different direction uh, from the local and the state level on that. Um, how, and really importantly, how do I maintain a safe environment? You know, we're getting more and more guidance and direction now, but there really was, um, you know, there was a bit of a void there for a while. Uh, and I think there's still big questions. How do I get the supplies necessary to maintain that safe environment? How do I get the services necessary to maintain that safe environment? And then again, sort of speaking directly to what Diane was talking about, frankly, how do I stay in business? So even if I have been able to remain open, I often have experienced very significant decreases uh, in children attending my program. Some of those may have been subsidized, some may not have been subsidized. Um, so just, you know, this overarching uncertainty undergirded by the financial fragility uh, of the system, like Diane talked about. Um, you know, related to those concerns in coordination with COE, Diane, Ferris, and others and his team, we launched an emergency response fund that we're still working on processing and getting payments out to the community for the first round of, and we're planning to do another round for the month of June. Um, but what we learned from that process was we received uh, some 159 applications, again, primarily from family child care homes. Uh, and those providers indicated almost 100% at the time, this was in May, that they needed cleaning supplies, that they needed personal protective equipment, and to a lesser but still significant extent, just basic things like baby wipes, diapers, and even baby food and technology. So, you know, uncertainty, how do I move forward in this context? How do I stay in business? And how do I maintain a safe environment and get the supplies I need to do that and just to provide quality childcare? Thank you, David. And yeah, any one of those issues would uh, or is, you know, a huge challenge to address. And then the combination or, or cumulative effect of all those is just staggering. Um, and Ferris, how about you in terms of some of the top issues, like top one or two issues that you're seeing and hearing about in terms of how this has all affected students and families and educators in the K-12 education system? Well, I think, uh, I think the equity issues have been have have really been exposed to a much higher level than than uh, for 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 maybe more people that weren't as aware of it as those who have been who've been working in, in education and other sectors. I think that uh, the three huge kind of uh, movements that are taking place that are impacting one is the COVID nineteen epidemic. Um, the second is the, the potential for financial cuts, which obviously is related to COVID nineteen. And then the third is uh, this movement to address systemic racism and the the um, the amount of of energy and love and anger that has come out of um, the death of of, of uh, George Floyd and um, at the hands of, of, of law enforcement in, in Minneapolis um, and and that kind of the energy that has brought us together as a community. Um, I think all of these factors are really coming together in a, in, a, in, a, in a crucial time so that this moment, I think, is, is extremely important. And it's a moment of change. I think there's a, so much of an opportunity right now. Um, but uh, as we're looking towards the reopening of school, and I can, I can talk about that um, yeah, whenever you'd like me to, uh, as we're thinking about our plans for, for the future and then also about how do we really make sure that we take advantage of this moment uh, to be able to to let the our community know about our disenfranchised uh, neighbors and community members who are really suffering right now and and not getting the resources that they need uh, how are some of our students are getting left out uh, and how we have to rethink our systems especially in education to be able to reach our most vulnerable community i think so i see this as um a bit of a, a wake-up call, a reality check for us, and I see it as an opportunity for us to pivot and and really embrace this challenge to be able to to create systems that are more equitable and um, are are and really start thinking about how we're going to transform our systems to 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 meet this challenge. Thank you, Ferris. That's why you're the perfect person to be on this call today because those are exactly the kinds of things that. We hope that this coffee chat provides an opportunity to talk about, hear about, and then that we can all walk away with ideas about what is our part in, in that pivot and, and creating that change. So Nicole, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Nicole. 
So that was a perfect seg, Ferris, to this question about the, the key elements of local plans and the state's guidelines with the caveat of what we know today or yesterday and that all of that could change quickly. So we know that the County Office of Education and all 10 school districts recently started working together to draft the plans that you referred to for safely opening childcare and schools. And that yesterday, the California Department of Education released its guidance document, which all of you would have received with your reminder email from Nicole Young this morning, and we'll send out again after, uh, send a link out again after this call. Um, there are lots of decisions yet to be made, and of course, we don't know exactly what will be happening in, in the fall. No one does, but for now, we'd like to hear some of the key elements of the local plans and the state guidelines, and I'll encourage all of you to keep questions and comments coming in the chat, because we'll have a chance to discuss those a little later. But Ferris, let's start with you. Can you give us a brief summary of the Restore framework for reopening schools safely and equitably? and what types of changes students, families, and educators could expect for the fall? I'd love to. Um, can I get um, access to share my screen? Yes. OK, go ahead and try it, Ferris. It works. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, using a, an older uh, presentation that I'm, I've modified. So there may, there may be some pieces in here that uh, you may not uh, be interested in seeing. But um, as this loads up, uh, you know, I just wanted to share with you uh, a little bit of our timeline of, of where things are at. It's, it's, it's kind of mind boggling to think that 10 weeks ago is when we first made the decision to close, or 11 weeks ago, when to uh, close down schools. And, um, and really we're working on this progression. Uh, we started focusing on distance learning, then we started focusing on grading and graduation. Now we're focusing on our budget and the reopening of schools. But there is that word that David used, uncertainty, um, is one that, that I think is extremely, is kind of, it's, it's very challenging to try to build solutions when the very foundation of what you're, build, what you're building on is so ambiguous and so unclear to us. And I think that part of what it has challenged us as leaders is really to figure out how to provide stability and reassurance within this, this, this environment of so much uncertainty. I'd like to share just a little bit of the kind of the timeline for you to, to see kind of where things are at at this very moment when it comes to our planning. So we just received uh, some guidance, one from the California uh, Department of Public Health on Friday and another document from the California Department of Education about the reopening of school. And they do provide some, some guidance that's useful. There's some really key questions that I'll talk about in a, in a moment, but uh, that we feel like are not really addressed clearly enough and that creates more uncertainty. But, uh, and just one example of that, for example, is um, whether we can mix groups of students. One of the things, one of the requirements that have been put on childcare providers is that you have a group of students, you're supposed to keep it under 12 and you can have one adult working with them and you can't move have that group of 12 students working with another group of 12 students. So that's one of the, the, the kind of the direction that we are working under. For schools, they're, it's not clear. They're say, they use the term when practicable, don't mix groups of students. Well, when practicable is a difficult, is not really giving us the guidance of whether, yes, we can do this or no, we can't do that. And it would be, you know, we're trying to get clarity and trying to get uh, to be able to, to build plans uh, that are where there isn't so much uncertainty included. So what we need to do is take the state guidance and work with our, our local folks, which basically is our public health officer, Dr. Gail Newell, and our superintendents and other stakeholders to put together local guidance and get away maybe less from, from I, the, that word guidance is, is not a great word for, for this kind of work, especially if you want to be grounded in science, but really provide direction to the schools in terms of how to open up schools. And, and that's um, that's kind of the, the, what we're hoping to do is that we'll probably provide enough information so that people can say it is safe to be able to do, to open school in the fall. We want, we want the greatest amount of flexibility to open up our schools with the least amount of risk for students and staff. That's really kind of the, the mindset. So it's trying to find that sweet spot that would allow us to be able to, to reopen schools. Because on one extreme, we're going to end up with, with schools closed as they are currently right now. Or on the other extreme, we'll end up creating a situation that will lead to um, people getting, getting sick. 
the other uncertainty that we're struggling with right now is our budget for 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 next year and the governor proposed a budget in on his may revise that looked at a 10 percent reduction of of the budget the state and assembly have countered that with with a budget that doesn't have those cuts in fact has has some increases but it's they both of those budgets are based on the assumption that the federal government is going to be uh, filling that hole that exists in the state budgets, and so there we're, we're kind of we are banking as a state on the, on that. And if that doesn't materialize, both of those scenarios are going to be really bad. The governor's idea is you cut now. The state and assembly is we'll do deferrals. We'll basically give you IOUs, and then we're going to have a cash flow problem where districts are not going to be able to make payroll. And so not getting that federal funding is going to be very, very, uh, very challenging for, for us. The other piece is that tax collection this year has been changed to July 15th. And so a lot of the assumptions about how much revenue is coming into the state is ba are also based on, on uh, projections and uh, kind of a best guess scenario. In July 15th, we'll know how much money is coming, has actually been collected and that could result in additional cuts. And um, as we're so we're shifting our 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 gaze and our focus to August and the reopening of schools, hoping that the cuts don't materialize because it would be impossible for us to open up schools in August if there are budget cuts. That's that's just a reality of things. We would not be able to have any kind of face to face program. And 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 so we're hoping that a lot of these questions are resolved. We're hoping that when we get our budgets by the end of June. We'll have some clarity and we'll find out hopefully soon that the federal government is in fact going to be providing the funding that we need. Um, so I, I talked about the three things that are impacting us, COVID-19 impacts, financial cuts to education, and the need to address systemic racism. Those really are the things that are coming together. Uh, and I do think that, that, that schools are part of that focus point in our community to create um, both a, a safe place to a, a safe venue to be able to discuss and really activate uh, our youth and 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 really address these issues but it's also um one that's creating a lot of a lot of uh um i would say it's, it's creating kind of turmoil in the system because we're really questioning everything and i think that again there is an opportunity here to reimagine rethink and redesign our schools and um but we have to do it carefully and thoughtfully so part of that careful and thoughtful process has been to really be real about how our families are addressing uh, the challenges that, uh, of our schools right now. And I've, I've shared this with other groups. These are some of the challenges that we faced. Um, things like basic needs, uh, food insecurity, lack of internet access. About 20% of our families don't have internet access. Increases in mental health uh, issues for, for our youth. Uh, not being able to address the unique needs of students, such as our special ed students and our language learners and, and other kinds of students. This pressure adaptation of families being in, uh, losing their livelihood, their, their, their work and their livelihood and feeling constrained and, and unable to, to participate in going about their lives normally. And then increases in, in reports of abuse and neglect that are taking place. And so all of these pieces have really put pressure on us as a system to pivot and to rethink about how we are going to be doing things differently. And it's not just a temporary band-aid to try to address some of these concerns uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. We see this as, as this is an opportunity for us to make sure that our community knows how these, these um, inequities exist and have existed for a long, long time. And that yes, they've, they've gotten uh, increased and exacerbated right now, but they have to be addressed. And we have to be thinking about all of these pieces beyond just looking at our education and, and student achievement as, as a fundament, as a foundation of what we're, what we're all about. And then um, I just wanna, and how much time do I have any? Let me know how much time I have. About a minute. I have a minute, all right. So I just wanted to share that we're looking at different scenarios of what schools would look like. Um, and so we have these different high restrictions, medium restrictions, and we have gotten guidance that is in between this red and yellow area, the guidance that we got on Friday and Monday. And so we're going to be working with Dr. Newell to try to get it hopefully on the yellow that would give us the, the ability to open up our high schools and, and some more flexibility. Um, and, um, but the idea of a six feet apart distance, it seems to be the, the and, uh, is, is really kind of the limiting factor.
And so we've also been mapping out all of the different categories, all of the different areas that we have to address. We've organized our work in instructional programs, health and safety and operations, student support and family engagement. Uh, the bigger school districts are, have their own process. We're working in parallel with them. And so we're kind of learning from each other and supporting each other. Um, and, and we're hoping to, to, to really be as thoughtful and as systematic so that we could apply, um, like yesterday we developed a uh, environmental, uh, what we're calling a facility inspection uh, report that would allow us to visit a school site or, or a district office and be able to review the environmental factors and decide what are the recommendations. You need to put a hand sanitizing station over here. You need to be able to put a sneeze guard over here, all those kinds of pieces. And so these kind of systematic approaches are going to help us uh, be consistent and create those systems that, that need to be in place and to be safe for, for, for our students. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stop there because I know I've, I've gone over my time. No, that's, that's perfect. Thank you, Ferris. And it's, it is uh, amazing to see the, the combination of the logistics details like hand sanitizing stations and then the, the more profound uh, philosophical equity issues to address things like the digital divide. So yeah. thanks for sharing that. And uh, Diane, what about the uh, current thinking among childcare and preschool providers about reopening? What, what could you share about well, I think how they're meeting the guidelines. I think that, you know, Ferris's um, uh, screen on um, equitable challenges is something that is certainly uh, seen and experienced in the early care field and something that uh, the field has been addressing for many, many years because we work so closely with our with our families and children. Um, the State Department also uh, released uh, guidelines for child care and providers. Uh, and I believe we sent out the link for that. And um, again, there it's guidance. Um, I think that, you know, as Ferris had mentioned, you know, there are gaps in understanding since this all started. And so many times, you know, we, we get the language that we hear is um, orders, guidance, directives. And so, trying to sift through the language in order to understand which of those needs to be adhered to, which are not just recommendations has been a challenge, I think, for our field. And I think that um, getting clarity around, for instance, our county's uh, public health director's group size, which is one to 12, was one of the issues that we, that I brought up actually at the, at a meeting, a statewide meeting, because, um, the Department of Social Service director was there. And so uh, it created such conflict in terms of, so can we have group size of one to 10 or is it one to 12? Who supersedes who? And so getting clarity on those types of uh, directives was extremely important so that our industry can move forward with planning uh, and, and greater understanding, especially for those programs that are, have continued to offer care and those who are planning to reopen. There's been some, um, uh, even within the guidelines, you'll, you'll see that it goes to a certain point. There are several, there's about nine, uh, nine topics to cover. Uh, the first is planning, cleaning, hygiene, arrival procedures, and so forth, all um, set in place to ensure the health and safety of children uh, and childcare providers in, in programs. Um, but with even within the guidelines, we've, we're finding there are exceptions to the rule too. So um, I think that uh, what, what I really appreciate about what Ferris is doing with, with the school district is really looking at creating a plan uh, in terms of a local plan and in, in, in terms of helping uh, programs open up. And so I want to take a look at the, the restore plan because I think it's, it's a value to look at how we can all be consistent about what we're doing within the childcare community as far as reopening. Um, and I think that, you know, again, there's a lot of trepidation, especially when we're, we're addressing children that are young. I mean, you know, toddlers and infants, um, and how we work with, with our young children in our classrooms is certainly something that we're not going to, you know, there's going to be some, some flexibility that needs to be built into that. Uh, and how we 
um, uh, reassess and use the guidelines uh, in in programs. So that's what I what I'm hearing is like. These are great, but you know we have to be practical, and we also have to be able to um, to work with our children in our classrooms uh, and families uh, in a way that is um, uh, in line with with the early care philosophy. So, um, so that's what what I'm hearing. I'm I'm happy that the guidelines came out. I think everyone is. Um, but I think too, again, we, again, it's going to be um, uh, on the honor system because I think that what, <laughs> you know, we're gonna try to implement everything to the best of our ability. And I think that, uh, you know, there's philosophical um, situations and, and concerns around that too as well. So that's what I'm hearing. Thanks, Diane. And I just wanna point out that Nicole Young has put links to the guidance um, on, on the chat so you can get directly to them if you want to look at those PDFs. David, do you have a quick um, comment to add here? Yeah, I mean, obviously a thread that goes through Ferris's comments and Diane's is that the implementation of any health-related restrictions in childcare or K-12 um, is practically feasible, simply means additional cost. And so from a policy perspective, we should be advocating for stable funding, for increased reimbursement for, for child care. And then I'd also say for mechanisms like uh, family child care tax credits and other mechanisms that allow help families who might not qualify for subsidized child care afford the high cost of care. Because there's just no way you can get around the fact that it costs more to have smaller groups, that it costs more to operate under the procedures and the guidance that, is, um, uh, that has been put out there. Uh, to support us uh, being able to provide care in a healthy and safe way. Great. Thanks, David. Um, thanks for keeping the questions coming in the chat. We'll get to those shortly. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Nicole Young for our last question of the morning. Thanks, Nicole. And, you know, so this is our last question for our, our guests, and they've each talked about it already in different ways. And so maybe treat this as kind of your uh, kind of closing thoughts on this as a way to um, kind of initiate or, or encourage ongoing discussion about, you know, how can this reopening process uh, be used as an opportunity to reimagine, rethink, redesign for equity so that the kinds of gaps and, and barriers to access and, and educational and, and social emotional and economic outcomes that we're, that we are making uh, progress in closing those um, not only in the birth of 12 education system, but really our community in general. And so David, this time we're going to start with you. Uh, here are any thoughts you have about that. Sure, yeah, and I look forward to hearing the other um, panelists' thoughts as well. Um, Ferris touched on this. We've all been touching on it. Um, but while, so I'd, I guess I'd start really at a pretty high level. While we've never had a crisis quite like COVID-19, at least in our lifetimes, um, like many natural disasters in our recent memory, COVID-19 has really starkly illuminated uh, the racial and class-based inequities in our society. And, you know, that's horrible to see and experience, but hopefully in the long term, it's a good that it's helped illuminate those and helped us understand them collectively together, I hope. Um, you know, when you think about Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, you know, immediately, those with significant means were able to fortify their homes or simply uh, fly away from the storm. Those in the middle class were maybe largely able to evacuate uh, via car, or seek shelter with family or friends, or if necessary, pay for lodging. But of course, the poor, um, not solely, but disproportionately people of color, most often were left behind, right? Stuck to the with the ravages of the storm and flooded homes. And you know, if you all remember the chaos of the Superdome, it was truly horrific and tragic. And so, I think about that a lot because with COVID, while different, again, our wealthy are largely and middle class have largely, especially office workers um, and analysts like myself, have been able to protect themselves and continue working from home and draw income in this crazy environment. Working class and poor, in particular in this crisis, those working, making less than 40000 a year, um, really stare at this uh, stark reality of the nightmare of abject poverty and homelessness or at best deciding to keep themselves and their families healthy, sorry, or at best going to work uh, and requiring them to be in contact, right, with other folks and be at risk. 
And God bless every single person that does that, that has made that decision from our grocery store clerks to our police officers to our childcare workers. Mm -hmm. But it's a bleak picture, right? So just that's a frame I wanted to set. Um, and I think fundamentally, the equity issue is the elimination of poverty, right? And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of race components of poverty, obviously. And you know, we, we have tools at our, at our hands to do that from things that have been talked about at the federal level, like public works programs and minimum basic income to free childcare and free higher education and a well-funded public K through 12 system. So those things are at our hands. Um, get it dry and a little more local and kind of in my experience and Ferris uh, touched on this as well. One area that I think that we're all aware of but has been starkly made apparent and raised its ugly head is um, the challenge of the digital divide. Right, immediately as the shelter in place orders went into effect, families without digital access, and that means internet connectivity, computer technology in the home, and the ability to use that technology were frozen out and isolated. Um, and that was true for the families we serve, for the family child care homes that serve our children. Um, and it was made even worse because we couldn't even deploy new technology, or at least it was very difficult to do that. And we certainly couldn't implement large scale in person trainings necessary to enable families and care providers to utilize that technology effectively. Um, I think our K through 12 system actually did a really stand up job. Um, the Office of Education, PVUSD in particular, stepping up to meet the challenge, getting Chromebooks out to the families. But there still is that fundamental issue that if you have technology in a family's hand or a child's hand, if they don't know how to use it or don't have the internet access, it's not gonna be that effective. So I think, again, it comes back to this fundamental issue of poverty, um, how we get there, uh, and a necessary ingredient to alleviating it is to help closing the digital divide. Because, um, you know, frankly, I hate to say it, but the coronavirus and COVID-19 disease is gonna rebound. It's already happening in many parts of the country. It's certainly happening across the world. Um, and frankly, in our lifetimes, it's likely that this will happen again or happen more than once, and it could be even more virulent and deadly. So we just need to take this clarion call and be prepared for the future. Um, so that does connect to childcare. Like I said, we have to have the online resources, the technology, the training to maintain connection, to help programs fulfill administrative requirements, to ensure payment, uh, and to support learning across the age spectrum. Um, so yeah, I hope that one way that we are reimagined for equity is to recognize the digital divide isn't an issue of convenience. Um, it's truly an issue of survival and certainly will continue to be in the future. Uh, we need to solve it and hopefully we can do things in Santa Cruz County that could be modeled in the country, in the state and the country. Great, thank you, David. And you did such a nice job of connecting the need for change at a high level, you know, policy level, and then uh, also connecting that to the everyday experience that many people in our community are having now. Um, how about Ferris? What, what are your thoughts about this question about, again, you've talked quite a bit about this being an opportunity to reimagine and rethink and redesign the education system. Can you share a few closing thoughts about that for us today? I think, I think, um, as, I sh as all three of us have shared, I do think that this is a moment that um, we need to embrace. I, when I think about the calls for reforms and to not only reforms, but really to rethink about how policing uh, is implemented in this country, you know, and I think about the, our responsibility as educators to, to help our youth to develop the kind of critical, to help them um, yeah, develop their critical thinking skills to become active participants in, in, in the decision-making process in, 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 the, in democracy and so on. So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here for our community to be, uh, to be, to step up and to really embrace this challenge and to say, I'm going to use my voice to protect our schools. I'm going to use my voice to make sure that what happened to George Floyd doesn't ever happen um, again in this country. And I think that, so that, that opportunity, that call to, to action is, is one that, that we, we uh, I think is, is exciting. And I think that it, it's, it's something that we're looking at is how do we make sure that we, in our efforts to make sure that our students have their well-being taken care of, that they have the academic skills, and also that we are being true to, to creating um, youth that are finding their voice and using their voice to, to transform the system as we're seeing happening all over.
this country and here in, locally in our community. So that's that's one aspect of this opportunity. I think that is, is something we need to embrace that that civic engagement component that is that is a necessary part of, of the solutions that we want to find. And I also believe in in uh, that we need to also take the opportunity to expose the inequities. That they are so stark and so painful and so um, damaging to our families. I think everybody needs to become aware of it because I think that we do have to um, take that have the mindset of the 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 passivity of of accepting the the kind of the comforts of, that I may have personally and and without taking into consideration the 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 challenges and suffering of other people has to stop and so I think that they're really looking at us as a as a system and and making sure that we are being very deliberate in our decision making and how we allocate resources and how we and the decisions that we make and making sure that the resources that are available are getting to the people that need it most and i think that we are so fortunate to live in this community in santa cruz county and when i listen to to you and, and to my colleagues we have such a commitment to equity and as we become more aware of the, the challenges it also gives us a pathway a map to to get to those solutions and so I think that this is that we have an opportunity right now to be able to um, to address these 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 challenges to really make sure that our schools are delivering on on, on addressing the, the inequities that exist and that our community has the information it needs to have to be able to to um, take that the, the the kind of the demand for justice and be able to transform it into action for that we can build on and and make our schools and our institutions better. Thank you, Ferris, and I'm guessing that I'm not the only one that on this call that feels appreciative of not only your leadership in this area and how um, genuinely you talk about the need to um, eradicate those inequities, but also your willingness to name racism and systemic racism as um, you know, one of the root causes of those inequities and that it's on all of us to take action to, to change that. And I think as someone who is an elected official that's in a highly visible leadership position. You just set a, such a good example for all of us about what's needed to make that happen. So thank you. And Diane, how about you? What are, what are your thoughts about all this? Well, geez, to follow these two dynamite speakers, I mean, I think that, you know, they both uh, said it in a nutshell. How, and uh, absolutely, I mean, the early care and education field uh, you know, we are, we, it is the industry that cares for some of the most vulnerable children in our, in our community. And absolutely, uh, those uh, inequities have been uh, something that, that we have observed over the years. And I totally agree with, you know, it be, this is our moment where you need to find your voice. Uh, as uncomfortable it may, as it may be, speaking up is critical during these times because we can't ignore it anymore. And I think that um, with regard to the childcare industry, I go back to funding. Uh, it, we are, the, the uncertainty of our field uh, is unacceptable at this point, uh, and it should be, and always has been. And I think that there has been a lens on the early care system now uh, through this pandemic because of uh, the realization of the need for child care uh, in order to uh, support our economic engine in our in our nation. And so um, I'm hoping, you know, that we can reimagine and we can redesign uh, our industry so that we, um, you know, have be brave about looking at the at the inequity inequities. Uh, and, and also speak up, uh, take the time to, to write your local uh, elected official, let them know, uh, and your state, let them know what the need is and why, because really, if families do it, those are the constituents that they're going to listen to. Uh, advocates can go and speak and, and, and meet with uh, the officials, but really, it's the testimonies from the families from the child care providers that are really going to help make change uh, in our funding streams and, and in our community. So, um, so uh, 
again, as uncomfortable as it may be, find your voice uh, because it is your voice that's going to make the difference as to whether or not um, we will be able to reimagine and redesign uh, with an equity lens in the future. So, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Sure. And I see that Nicole Lezen has uh, recopied and pasted the link that Ferris had shared about um, some of the tools and, and ways to advocate with our legislators uh, It's in the chat box. And so we have a few moments left. We'd like to try to get to some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat box and give our guests a chance to <laughs> answer these big complex questions in just a, a minute or two. And so Nicole, do you have one that you think would be good to start with? Yeah, I actually think there's a cluster of them that relate to things that happen outside the classroom. So about um, outside educators coming in or students going out for field trips, for example. Um, are there, do you have any um, ideas about how that's going to work um, after school or outside of the classroom guidance? So that I, I could share a little bit. So the guidance encourages us to work outdoors um, just because of for because the, the likelihood of, of transmission is smaller. And so that I think that that's something that we uh, people are looking at is how to use kind of the outdoor spaces as uh, a place where we can we can provide instruction without the, the same concerns that, that we would have in those more enclosed classroom spaces. I think that the we are also being discouraged from bringing uh, volunteers and and guests, and uh, because of increasing the uh, the numbers of kind of uh, of connections that we would have with uh, with other people, and so those are some of the pieces that I think that long term I think there's going to be some opportunities to be able to to think about having different kinds of learning uh, opportunities for students, like this idea of, of really having a much more blended uh, learning experience for all students, where some of your coursework is gonna be at home, some of it will be in, in a traditional classroom, and some of it could be in, in, in more of a real world classroom, uh, or classrooms without walls, if you would. And I think that those are the kinds of things that will are gonna be evolving. And I think those are the kinds of things that will stay after COVID-19 is, is no longer as big a concern as it is right now. So, um, so there's definitely the, those are kind of opportunities that people are thinking about uh, implementing um, to one address the limitations of working within the classroom, but also to to think about how else we can work with our students. Thanks, Diane. Anything to add? Yeah, um, I also say that in the guidance for childcare, uh, there there's uh, strong recommendations to take uh, the classroom outside. Uh, and there is also guidance for day camps too that was recently released on Friday as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think that outdoors is best. But again, you know, bringing in uh, additional people or or volunteers and and speakers is not something that they're um, recommending this time. This time. And another question that just came in through the chat is, um, when do we foresee the home daycares reopening for non-essential workers? Now. Um, the, the guidance was released uh, and the language is very clear that it is for all child care programs with modifications. If you go to the website where the guidance is at, you will see that it is uh, definitely for all. We, so everyone can begin going through the reopening process. Okay, thanks for that. Are there other questions that people want to raise that we have not addressed yet? Do you throw through the chat or perhaps raise your hand? As you're scanning those, I just want to say I've noticed and you addressed it a little, there's been a lot about how to advocate. Just to be really crystal clear, there is advocacy you can do at the federal level for additional stimulus. There's obviously an election. And while we can't influence you in which way to vote in that, you can do your own research to understand um, which, uh, which candidates and which parties might create the environment that we're talking about. Um, and then there actually are opportunities at the state level right now to generate new revenues, which we desperately need, especially if there's no federal stimulus. So I encourage everyone to look into um, initiatives that are happening right now that could come to vote in November that could generate significantly new resources for public education and public systems. Thank you, David. Couldn't agree more. Um, we've got a couple specific questions about athletics, how that's going to start up. 
and then a question specifically about busing that was originally related to field trips but applies to many other aspects of transporting students. So either of those is fair game. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of, of clarity here. Um, the busing, they are talking about uh, distance on the buses, that distance, that, so having a, maintaining uh, distances and also uh, face coverings for students and um, face coverings and also uh, temperature taking. So it's, it's not clear exactly how those things would be implemented, but it's going to definitely be very different, smaller numbers of students on the buses for sure. And athletics is, is another one that has not been addressed. There, we are having lots of conversations, and, and this is something that we were hoping that we would get some more direction at the state level, but we haven't. And so um, the, uh, I would say that the likelihood that we would be able to have a traditional, that we would start the uh, athletics programs in August is, is not likely. My guess is, if I were to, to kind of make a guess here, is that we would, it would end up being delayed uh, somewhat, maybe having a later opening. And that's what one of the one of the the areas that people have been talking about is moving a lot of the athletics programs that would normally start and uh, moving them later closer to the winter time, so that uh, things could be more stable and we would have uh, more clarity as to how how we'd be able to implement those programs. Okay, great, thanks. I noticed there are a couple advocacy links in the chat from Allison and Jamie, including um, a, a training for junior high and high school teachers about informed and equitable voting activity. So. Just check those out as well. Thanks for sharing those, Jamie and Allison. Diane? Oh, I just wanted to mention that the Childhood Advisory Council is also an advocacy group. Uh, we have 24 uh, early care and education stakeholders and we are constantly advocating on behalf of children, families, and um, child care providers too in our county okay, at the great. local, state, and federal level. Thanks for that reminder. And for those of you who haven't formally participated in advocacy activities before, we hope you'll check these out. It's not scary. It's actually very affirming and can make you feel like you're doing something, which for those of us who feel helpless or frustrated by the, the pace of change, it can be a really encouraging experience. So I encourage all of you to check these out. We're running very close to end of time. So Keep those questions coming. We will collect them and, and see if we can gather some answers from Ferris, Diane, and David. But before we all scatter, just really wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to all three of you from all of us. I really wanna echo what Nicole said um, and those of you who've mentioned this as well. We are so, so fortunate to have leaders like you in our community. And if anybody can craft a way through this to a, a better new normal, I think Santa Cruz County can do it. So thank you for sharing your ideas and insights and good luck to everyone as we proceed with reopening. We also wanted to remind you that we have a feedback survey. You can see the, the URL in the chat and we gather your feedback and take it very seriously. And that's how we gather some of the ideas for chat topics. And we have a lot of interesting uh, topics coming up. We hope you'll keep joining us. We have a longer core conversation on uh, the urgency and opportunity of collective action for racial equity and justice. So building on some of the themes we've heard today, but in other sectors as well. Then we've got a specific um, core, core coffee chat on the environmental movement and, and race uh, here in the county later in June. We've got a session on supporting older adults during COVID-19. And all of these have the theme of what we've learned and what we can apply to a better future. Um, specifically some tools from the community resilience model that has some, um, some techniques that people can use themselves with colleagues and, and clients or patients as well. So lots of um, topics and tips coming up and we'll keep you posted on what else is coming in July. But meanwhile, thank you all for being with us, taking part of your morning and continuing to join us on Tuesdays at 10. Um, keep those questions coming. We'll hang out for, for a few minutes and see if we can address any others that you may have. Thank you, Ferris, Diane, and David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.